Hi, everyone. Today, for the 200th episode of the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast, I am going to talk with Rebecca Decker about solidarity in birth work. Welcome to the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. My name is Rebecca Decker, and I'm a nurse with my PhD and the founder of Evidence-Based Birth. Join me each week as we work together to get evidence-based information into the hands of families and professionals around the world. As a reminder, this information is not medical advice. See evbirth.com slash disclaimer for more details. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the EBB podcast. My name is Ihotu Jennifer Ali, pronouns she, her, and I will be your host for today's episode. So today is a very special day. It is the 200th episode of the Evidence-Based Birth Podcast. What? <laughs> this is a huge milestone because most podcasts don't make it this far. <laughs> Our team also wanted to celebrate the fact that we have surpassed 2.5 million downloads of this podcast. And to do so, we wanted to talk with the founder of EBB, Dr. Rebecca Decker, about a topic that is very near and dear to all of our hearts. My name is Ihotu Jennifer Ali, and I'm a research associate at EBB, and I was featured on last week's episode episode 199, as well as in episode 143 on reproductive justice. Before we get started, I want to make you aware of a content warning that we will be having a discussion about racism and white supremacy culture. If there are any other detailed content or trigger warnings, we'll post them in the description or the show notes that go along with this episode. And now I'd like to introduce our honored guest, whose voice you may already be familiar with. But now we get to switch spots and I'm going to interview her instead of the other way around. And since this interview is about solidarity and birth work, Rebecca also has a few questions for me as well. So let's get to it. Dr. Rebecca Decker is the founder and CEO of Evidence-Based Birth and the author of Babies Are Not Pizzas. They're born, not delivered. Dr. Decker has earned a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in nursing. From 2010 to 2016, Dr. Decker was an assistant professor of nursing at the University of Kentucky College of Nursing. In 2016, Dr. Decker left academia to focus full-time on the mission of evidence-based birth. The team that she leads, and I'm very proud to be a part of, helps birth workers build the evidence-based knowledge skills and power they need to protect families' abilities to give birth with empowerment. The work that we do at Team EBB goes on to directly and indirectly impact families who are searching for evidence-based information to empower their prenatal, birth, and postpartum experiences. Yay, thank you for that introduction, Ihotu. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So what questions do you have prepared for me? So I have some great questions I have lovingly prepared. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask, how did we meet? And what's one story or moment between us that illustrates the kind of connection we have on maybe a human or a soul level, despite how different we might be? So the first time I remember meeting you virtually was actually during the uprisings in Minneapolis after the murder of George Floyd. I think you were already a professional member of evidence-based birth, but I didn't know you personally. And I had made a, a statement online publicly, and I'd also sent out several emails to our audience of about 45,000 people with some action items. And you wrote back, and I feel the depth of your pain and emotions. And I, what do you need? Like, what do you need me to do? And at the time there was just so much suffering going on. You like literally couldn't tell me what you needed. And I think sometimes we find that when people are in the midst of a crisis, they don't know what they need. Right. But, um, so I waited until you were ready, um, to respond. But in the meantime, I went on your website for the Minnesota healing justice network and started following some of the action items there. 
And then you wrote me back. Not only did you tell me what you need, but you had like convened with the entire Minnesota Healing Justice Network and had a discussion about what we should ask Rebecca. And so I just remember being so impressed, like that you didn't just say, hey, can you do this for me? You were like, we developed a 10 point action plan for you. And I was like, okay, like these people know what, what's up and I'm going to do as they say. And that's like, those, that, that was my first interaction with you. And since then we've had the honor of like meeting in person one time this summer at a retreat, but otherwise we've mostly been meeting by zoom because in February of 2021, you reached out and asked if you thought now you said, Rebecca, should I apply for this position that you have open as research associate? And I was like, yes, <laughs> of course, um, because you have your background, you know, in research and public health. And I was so impressed by, you know, how you were open and transparent about what you needed from evidence-based birth during that time. And um, you were unapologetically, you know, working on healing your community and yourself. And I was like, of course you should apply. And so, yeah, that's when we started working together weekly and meeting weekly. And even before we started working for EBB, we invited you to come on the podcast um, and do a takeover and like literally take over. I didn't interview you. Your group just had a discussion. And I think that reflected some trust, like that we developed really quickly between each other and that I trusted you as an expert in your area and you trusted me to like, you know, not traumatize you <laughs> by, by, you know, you reached out to me, you kept the conversation going. And so we kind of developed a, a trust rather quickly that has been growing. I mean, it wasn't perfect from the beginning, but, and it still isn't, but I think that there was an element that we knew we could kind of count on each other to be, you know, who we were, that we were genuine people. Right. Does that make sense? Right. Absolutely. You brought so many memories back to my, my mind just now, too. And I think, you know, the moment for me would be during the retreat, you know, being able to go out to Kentucky and see the way that you run a retreat. And I think many of us were so surprised and impressed that you, you know, gave us the platform. You know, you were like, I would love for you to do, you know, talk on anything that you feel is important for EBB instructors to learn about. And, you know, I was able to talk about cultural appropriation and talk about cultural medicines and my work, my healing work that's outside of EBB. And for me, that was a moment when I felt like I could really, it wasn't just I was working for you, but I, this was like an integration of not only who I am and the work I want to do, but adding research in a way that empowers people and reaching a larger audience. And you trusted, I feel like you really trust your team and that. I don't always see often. So that we've all said we, we drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> and yeah, I'm just really, really happy to see this continue to grow, this relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so let's go back a little bit into your story, Rebecca. What was your early experience with race? You know, understanding race as a concept and with people of different backgrounds and lifestyles, maybe in your neighborhood or your schools? Yes. So I write about this a little bit in my book, Babies Are Not Pizzas, but I grew up in the suburbs of Memphis, Tennessee, which is a part of the country that has a long racialized history with a lot of violence and a lot of hatred. And there's a lot of sadness there. And when I talk about it, I, I'm not really exactly sure what to say because I didn't really understand what was going on there as a child. It was a highly segregated city. You know, Memphis has always been around 80% black, but the suburbs are like, you know, like 90% white. And the concept of white flight to the suburbs and the abandonment of the inner city was like something I witnessed on a regular basis. People, grown ups talking around me about, oh, that neighborhood's going downhill. Like as soon as a black family moved in, like that was just like normal language that I would hear at my friends, parent, you know, parents houses. I didn't understand why it was like that. It didn't make sense to me. And I saw the tension 
and I saw the segregation, but I didn't understand the history. And other than, you know, the basics of the Civil War and the basics of the Civil Rights Movement, there really wasn't anything taught um, in our public schools or private schools about the racialized history of Memphis, including the bombing of black neighborhoods, of um, the terror of Jim Crow and lynching. And it was never explained to me as a child. And in fact, through my whole experience, through all of my degrees of undergraduate and many years of graduate school, I was never educated on any of this stuff. It's something that I had to self-educate about starting in my 30s. And so there was that. But in my immediate family, I had um, a family member who was disabled in a wheelchair. And I also had several adopted family members who are of Korean ethnicity. And my mom was always very open and talking about how horrible Jim Crow was um, when she was growing up. So she was white and grew up in Texas, you know, grew up witnessing the segregation on city buses and in schools. And she talked about how unfair it was. She talked about openly about how when she was a nurse in Louisville, Kentucky, in her first nursing job, she remembers when they were forced to hire the first black nurse in this hospital in Louisville and how nobody would talk to that nurse. And everybody was, you know, just acting like it was the worst thing ever. And my mom thought that was wrong. And she didn't believe that we should treat people differently because of their skin color. So she was always very open and talking with me about those things as a child. But I still think there still was like a lack of depth of understanding. I know my father, when he was in the Air Force, he actually flew troops to Mississippi to desegregate the university there. So my parents were very much like alive during the desegregation. You know, they were young adults raising their children uh, before I was born. And I came along later in the 1980s where this stuff was recent enough that it was obviously influencing everyday life in Memphis, but it wasn't in any history books and nobody was talking about what had happened or making any kind of reparations. So that's kind of the background of how I grew up. And I, I grew up in a white family, like I said, with some um, Korean American family members. But um, for the most part, my family was of 100% um, European um, ancestry. My grandparents on my dad's side uh, were Dutch immigrants from the Netherlands in the early 1900s. So about um, half of my ancestry is Dutch. And I'm married to a Dutch American as well. My husband is 100% Dutch American. And I remember at the EBB instructor retreat, you saying that you had a family member who had disabilities. And I have a sister with disabilities as well. And I just remember that being like this connection between us. Mm -hmm. And you also, I remember you also said something about having Dutch ancestry and something about Dutch culture that really stuck with me. And I asked you to share it in the retreat and I'm going to ask you to share it here again. You want me to talk about that? Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things I have found is that a lot of white people in America don't, they think they don't have a quote culture, like, or an ethnicity um, and that's part of the lie of white supremacy and the dominant culture is that you think you're the norm and everything else is ethnic or cultural, but you're just the norm, like, because you're dominant and you don't actually start to dissect like what makes up your culture. So I did a few years ago, start making this and you, you were going to ask me about this later on. I know, but I'll go ahead and bring it up. This bullet point list of aspects of white culture, my list. It's literally just a Word document on my desktop that's called Aspects of White Culture, my list. And I started bullet point listing things that I knew that were like cultural norms in my white community growing up and still today. And then as I went on, I started thinking more and more about uh, my ancestry. And a lot of this is for my relationship with you and a lot of um, African Americans and black people that I have worked with are, you know, they talk a lot about their ancestors. And I hadn't really thought about it that much, even though I have like an ancestry.com account and I have to kind of trace some things, but you know, Dutch culture in particular, that's like half my, my family. And my grandparents came to 
America as immigrants. I'm a granddaughter of immigrants. My grandmother came with her parents when she was an infant. And my grandfather came alone as a teenager when he was only like 18 or 19 years old. He left behind his entire family and came by himself. And I only met them a few times. I don't remember a whole lot about my Dutch grandparents because they were in their 80s when I was born and they died um, when I was a small child. So a lot of what I learned about my Dutch ancestry like comes from like family lore, like stories written by my dad and his twin brother. And one of the things I learned about Dutch culture, and a lot of people talk about my grandfather, how he was an extremely opinionated man who liked to share his opinions with just about anyone, sometimes in a very forceful manner. That's a direct quote from my uncle. And that was passed on, even though I didn't have a relationship with my grandfather, my siblings and I started exhibiting some of those same characteristics as children. We were never afraid to share our opinions with the adults in the family. And we could all be quite stubborn and strong-willed, just like my grandfather. And so I looked it up and I found that Wikipedia says about Dutch customs that in most matters, Dutch people tend to be straightforward and open, a tendency known as besprekbaarheid, which literally means speakability. And then I found another article that says, what non-Dutch people think is rude or blunt, the Dutch perceive as honesty and truth. They pride themselves in having and expressing an opinion. They consider American, quote, politeness as a form of weakness and hypocrisy. And Dutch people don't believe in sugarcoating things. And I just laughed because I don't know if you've been watching Ted Lasso. This um, It's a very popular show on Apple right now about an American coach who goes to England and coaches a football team there. Um, but they have a Dutch player on the football team, and it's kind of this running joke all season that he just says, like, the most blunt things, and everybody looks at him like he's so rude. And they're just like, oh, he's Dutch. Like He's just, like, saying what he thinks. So <laughs> I thought that was, like – interesting that like, you know, this was an aspect of my culture that somehow seeped down into me and my siblings, even though we weren't, didn't have a lot of exposure to our grandparents. And it's just like an example of how culture can persist through generations, even when you don't know that that's what's happening. And I think it's a benefit. Like I can lean on that Dutch tendency of mine to not be afraid to speak the truth. And, um, that's a, a difference between me and a lot of my friends and social group. And I mean, even when I worked in academia, people were like, do you remember that one time Rebecca, like in front of the whole research team, like let everybody know, like what they were, you know, how they were harming someone. And I'm like, yeah, like if I see something wrong, I'm going to speak up. Like that's just, but then that's so funny that my grandparents did that because I didn't really know them. So, yeah. Well, that's, uh, that was a key moment when I learned that about you, that I started to trust you more. Because as someone who lived in New York for a decade and is used to kind of straight talking to New Yorkers, but then also originally from Minnesota and moved back here, you know, about five, six years ago, the kind of racism that often shows up here is that people will be nice to your face, this kind of very um, Scandinavian, Lutheran, Christian, very conservative culture will be nice, or they, they talk about Minnesota nice as being very polite, but you never invite someone over for dinner, you never, you know, hang out with them outside of the workplace, or, you know, you'll be polite, but you won't actually be kind or compassionate or empathetic, and you won't be direct. And so you might think you have a friend, and then you realize they're not actually your friend. And so I always really value people who are very direct, especially when it's someone who's, you know, European ancestry and white in these days. And when I was like, oh, Rebecca just tells it how it is. And then everything that you're saying, I can really trust and I can relax into that. Um, That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's one benefit, I guess, of, you know, my culture. There's, there's also ne many, many negative things, but it's something that I think it's important for everybody to like, think about how you grew up, what you've inherited from your ancestors, whether you realized it or not, you know, in the past and, and lean into what works for you and then decide what you're going to reject and what like patterns you're going to stop. So yeah. Absolutely. Like you could use that straight talkingness to call out things that are justice issues, or could you, you could use it to just be a mean person you could society. you could I use it use and it. i have exactly and i did have some of my great relatives 
I know, for example, a great aunt who died many, many years ago who was known for just being really mean. So like it can be used for harm as well. That's true. So I'd love to look more peek into your white culture list. Would you be willing to share a few examples with me? Sure. Okay. So I have to say that my white culture list um, also, I think if you're going to make up your own list, if you're listening to this and you're of any culture, I think it's always eye opening to examine your own culture. But I think it's important to remember that class also like has an influence on any white culture list. So I grew up what I would consider upper middle class. And so there's going to be differences on there from people who grew up in other classes. But my upper middle class white community that I grew up in valued timeliness also being polished and professional, only allowing proper English grammar and vocabulary, asking what do you do for a living or what do you do for work is an emphasis on your value in society is based on what you do for a living. Um, and also finding out the status of, of who you're talking with, like to find out if they're on your status or if they're higher or lower than you. Only speaking English and complaining when people don't speak English I think it's interesting that in my culture, um, my community, a lot of people complain about having to get together with families you don't like. It's like you complain about having to get together with extended family. There's a lot of either or thinking, a lot of us versus them thinking, a big emphasis on being polite and nice. And um, you mentioned that in Minnesota, that was definitely something in the South. Although I think in the South, there's a little bit more, I think, genuine friendliness, but you definitely need to be a quote, like good girl. Like you need to be polite as possible, avoiding confrontation, but then holding grudges, <laughs> even after someone's apologized, believing that you should pull yourself up by the bootstraps. And there's an emphasis on individualism, which is very much a white supremacy culture, um, concept. Um, another thing that comes along with the privilege of being white is, and especially being white and middle class or upper middle class or upper class is like feeling like you deserve the best in everything and that your children deserve the best in everything. And because of that, you want to talk to the manager. I mean, this is like the classic Karen thing that we see on all these videos that go viral. Like, you know, like just believing that you're the best and you deserve the best and you're going to knock people other down on your way up. Um, and then one of the things that I see a lot, especially for white women, is they interrupt each other a lot um, to make sure their voice is heard. Or on the other hand, they might stay quiet in meetings because their opinion is already being voiced by other people who look like them. And so you have like the luxury of being quiet or introverted if you want to. And the same thing, I see that on social media all the time that white women really have difficulty listening to people of color and instead they want to jump in and they always have to make their opinion heard. So it's always having to have the last word. And a lot of that, again, goes with that privilege of feeling like you deserve more because you're better and superior it goes back to white supremacy. Um, other funny things like include like um, having difficulty letting go at a dance or a party unless alcohol is being ingested. I'll never forget like going to the Caribbean with Dan on our honeymoon. And we were on this boat ride uh, with all these Dominican guys who were like leading this boat tour. And they were trying to get all the white Americans to loosen up and like dance and like move and chill. And like none of them could do that until they started drinking. And then finally they were able to like let go. So, yeah, that I mean, there and there's more. It goes on and on. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any there that re relate to, like, pregnancy or childbirth or raising children? You should wait until marriage to have children. And also, I was raised the belief that you should preferably wait until marriage to have sex as well. Girls should play with dolls and boys play with trucks, cars, and action figures. Like, the importance of privacy, so children should have their own bedroom with it's the woman's responsibility to plan for contraception and you shouldn't have too many children too close together or when you're too young. And for example, if an 18 year old had a baby and um, then got pregnant again, one year later, um, a white woman from my middle class group would probably think that's a travesty because it will make her life too difficult. So there's a lot of judgment around um, the timing and spacing of children, if that makes sense which I know, I think I've talked with you about it, how in other cultures it's considered a blessing and 
it's really interesting to see like that white women in particular hold these like really strong judgments about the reproductive choices of other groups and other people. We have a lot of judgment on each other about pregnancy and childbirth and who should have babies. And, and again, it goes back to that feeling of being superior than others and making you feel like you're superior. I know this is, this may be hard to listen to you for some people. Cause I'm just, I'm being, I'm doing the blunt talk right now. Like this is like, there's a lot of negative stuff on my list. There's a few positive things, but most of what I've just read to you has been pretty negative, I think, and harmful to other cultures. And this is what I hope is kind of the, another phase of solidarity and justice work. You know, we've had so much conversation and debate and call outs around and, you know, conversations about the police and violence and really highly charged issues. And from, from us in Minnesota, you know, Minneapolis, we f feel like the conversation has completely changed or it's gone away, or maybe people aren't paying attention or caring about the racial justice like they did a year ago. And, you know, different studies being shown that support for Black Lives Matter dropped precipitously after, you know, last summer. What I'm hoping for is that we can continue to have these conversations, but also about culture, because this is the, the water that we swim in all the time. And, you know, to understand the the way that we were grown, we were raised. Like I, on my culture list, you know, I have two different culture lists because on one side, I'm Irish, Polish, Minnesotan, Southern Minnesota farm people, very low class. And then on the other side, I'm a Nigerian immigrant family. And so what's interesting is I find a lot of similarities between my two sides. For example, um, food, get it when it's hot, don't come late or there won't be any food. That's on both sides of my family. <laughs> <laughs> you know, dressing up on my Nigerian side of the family, I say people definitely dress up if they can on my mom's side. Um, we don't really dress up. It's really relaxed. Um, but then you might have something like timeliness where, yeah, on both sides of my family, we're pretty late. <laughs> we show up when we can. And so like you're saying about class, race, we could also add in language or nationality or culture. There's Black Americans, there's, you know, Black immigrants. And I feel like this gets into the the why and the how we get to racism, because we see each other, each other's ways of being is different from our ways of being, and we judge it, you know, as bad just because it's different. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think with white culture, the thing that's so toxic is that they don't see this as culture. All these things I just told you, they don't even think about them. They just live that way. And they assume that everybody should assimilate to that. And that's what makes this like, that's what makes toxic work environments for black people. It's what makes um, toxic communities. This like expecting everyone to have the same culture, but not even realizing you're, you're expecting that. It's just like, why aren't you living like us and why aren't you acting like us and we're going to judge you and we're superior than you. And it just creates this element of, of oppression in a community that is dangerous and harmful to families. Like you and I know, you know, the research on racism and childbirth and pregnancy and how it affects actual lives of children and birthing people. It sounds kind of cliche to read off these things, but when when you realize that many people in my white community don't even realize that they hold these expectations for everyone else and they're judging everyone else on these, like st what we've decided are the standards of living, but we haven't even like named it publicly or understood where it comes from, uh, can be really dangerous. I think it was Ijeoma Oluo who spoke in, um, so you want to talk about race, about how this is very subconscious. Like you have to go below the level of the consciousness. And so when Ibram X. Kendi's talking about, you know, so you want to be uh, anti-racist, it's not just standing up and saying I'm anti-racist or I, even that you support um, anti-racist policies, you also need to look inside yourself and say, what am I carrying that's judgment, right? And then how do I act on that? Or, or actively work to pr protect people from that kind of judgment, even if it's not something that you hold yourself. Mm -hmm. So that leads me to another question, which is for you, you know, this term solidarity or being an anti-racist, or I like to also use the term like being a protector. Um, what does that look like for you on a regular basis? 
So I think I, I want to talk about the meaning of solidarity because like what it looks like and what it means are connected. But to me, solidarity means that like knowing that we are bound together, that our, our fates are intertwined and meaning our fates of our communities at like a community level. And I was wondering if it's okay to share something from my faith community. Is that all right? Go ahead. Okay. So this summer I heard a sermon from um, my pastor, Reverend Stephen Fearing, and he quoted a black pastor in greater Atlanta, Reverend Aisha Brooks Johnson. And it was a sermon about um, the book of Ruth, um, where Ruth says, you know, do not press me to leave you to her mother-in-law. You know, your people shall be my people and your God, my God, where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. It's a very moving story when Ruth clings to her mother-in-law. And even though her mother-in-law is from a different culture, a different community. And in her commentary on this passage, um, Reverend Aisha Brooke Johnson said, quote, we have experienced a lot of death, grief, and loss in the midst of a global pandemic, racial brokenness, economic disparity, and political division. Can you imagine a world in which we took spiritual oaths like the one we find in the book of Ruth? What if you resisted the temptation to fight or flee in the face of grief, pain, and oppression? What if we took these vows with members of our human family? Imagine a member of the human family before you and speak these words aloud to them. By the mercy of God and because of God's grace, we are bound to one another. Your pain is not your own, but is now my pain. The plight of your people is held in my hands and my heart as if they were my own. Where you journey and work, I too will journey and work alongside you with God's help. Where your bones are buried, may I too find a resting place and declare every earthly resting place sacred in the eyes of God. End quote. Beautiful. Yeah, I know, wasn't it? <laughs> and yeah, that's just that solidarity. <laughs> So I was actually talking with a friend, so in the Minnesota Healing Justice Network and also in my other work, the Oshun Center for Intercultural Healing, we have solidarity members, right, who come on to, like, support us for the long haul. And I was just talking with one of them the other day, and we were trying to think of words to describe. So you have a, you have a biological family, and people, as birth workers, like, we care so much about our family, but this idea of, and I was using the term soul family, but in this quote, it talks about a human family, and it just makes me think about like the people we're supposed to walk in this world with who might come from whatever background, whatever lifestyle, but like, we're supposed to find them and walk with them and they may not be biologically related to us, but there's a, there's, there's a, a connection. connection. Yeah. yeah. We're supposed to find those people. And knowing that our fates are bound together. Like it's not just verbiage. It's true. You know, like because we're all so connected what happens to one community affects the other. We're all like intertwined. So it's not just like working to serve one community. It's really in the end, it will uplift everyone because white supremacy harms everyone. It's, it's obviously got disparate harms on black and other communities, but it also harms the white community as well in ways they don't understand. So it's important for all of us to do the work. Yeah, that beautiful quote that um, if you've come here to, you know, save me, you know, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up in mine, I think about that a lot and how my life has been enriched by actually being in relationship with people of many different backgrounds. Um, my mom being white, my dad being black. I'm having cousins from outside the United States, having an aunt from Hong Kong, having a, a cousin who is Native American background. I, I feel this sense of connectedness that I think also comes when, you know, we have a global pandemic and we're trying to, you know, get along or even these moments of like 9-11 or moments of tragedy, but also like a deep connectedness with the world that I think some spiritual traditions get out. A yoga class, sometimes you feel this like oneness. I, that's for me why it's worth it for me to be in contact with people of different backgrounds. And mm -hmm. I, I hope other people feel that way too. Yeah. Well, can you say, but it is, it can be challenging. So do you feel like there's ebbs and flows 
or you know in your how do you manage your capacity for because I, I think there's a, the sense that okay well if i'm a white body person i have to just do more or give more and what if i have a family and busyness and work and you know life's not easy for me i'm a woman or i'm queer how do you manage that sense of like expectation versus this sense of just connectedness but also the reality of needing to have action around mm -hmm. here sense of connectedness. Well, I think it's important to keep in mind like two aspects of white supremacy culture, which I've learned a lot about from the writings of Tima Okun. If you just Google aspects of white supremacy culture, you'll find his writings. And he talks about how a sense of urgency and perfectionism are aspects of, of white supremacy culture, which I don't think most white people realize. And that and because they think that's normal. They think it it is what you're supposed to do. They don't realize that other cultures don't necessarily practice that. Like, first of all, when you're saying like, don't you feel like you have to get it all done? Like, no, you can't. Like, I can't be perfect and I have to get rid of that expectation. But um and I can't it can't be urgent. It's not like in one year you're going to become a perfect anti racist. Like if I was enmeshed in a white supremacist culture for the first 30 or so years of my life before I even realized it. Like I have a lot of unlearning to do. It's something that you're going to be doing the rest of your life. So that helps take the pressure off. I think knowing that it's a lifelong journey, not like something you you're going to fix about yourself because it's never going to be truly fixed. And I follow my passions and, and, and learning about anti-racism and social justice and, I find things that interest me and then I, I work on them for a while. I pick one or two things and I just prioritize it. So for example, reading, I love to read for pleasure, but I also have a goal that every month I'm working on a new book, like related to social justice and oppression. And it's just like, I always have one on my nightstand and I have for like the past, I don't know, five or six years. It's just, it never goes away. There's always another book there because the learning never stops, but I don't feel an urgency. Like I have to get it all done by a certain time. I think that's huge. I know a lot of people who've just kind of stopped because they feel like it's so much work and they just can't do it and they can't do it perfectly. And so they don't do it at all. And one thing I remember being impressed and surprised about starting to work with you, Rebecca, was um, little things like you mentioned from the beginning that we don't, we try not to at EBB practice perfectionism and not to practice urgency and open dialogue. And we, you know, like, a, we had, like there was something around embracing conflict, you know, that I felt like this was a space where I could really show up without the, you know, before we even, we didn't even have to say it, but you walk into a workspace and you assume, you know, that there's going to be certain things that are required of you. And you were like, nope, <laughs> this is going to be more of a relaxed space. And everybody were like, I want you to meet each other. I want you to know each other's birthdays. You asked about, do I have any children or cats or <laughs> things that people should know about me? I felt like it was more of an environment, like when you're in a family, rather than when you're in a professional environment, because a professional environment, now you have to zip up your coat and become someone that might not be authentic. And I feel like that's how white, cult white supremacy culture hurts all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Because none of us get to be authentically who we are. We have to play the role and be inside the box and kind of compete with each other rather than just be being collaborators and being open. I think every single team member at EBB has had a moment where they screwed up like in the first three to six months of working for EBB and had like this, oh shit, like Rebecca's going to fire me like moment. And then I'm just like, oh, it's okay. Like we all make mistakes, like no big deal. And they're just like, what? I thought they were going to, you know, I thought I was going to get fired. Like, and it's just like, no, listen, like nobody's perfect. And obviously like if there's patterns of, of difficulty, like that's one thing, but just one making one mistake, like that's how we learn. And, you know, that is very different than most workplace cultures. So right. I've tried to be really intentional to make a list of all the things that are toxic about most workplaces and are rooted in white supremacy and try to fish them out. And I'm not perfect. I'm sure there's still some there, but I'm working on it. Yeah, I love that. I experience it. I'm grateful for it <laughs> because when I started working for you, I had PTSD really bad and you were very 
questions? <laughs> I think most yeah. most of my <laughs> most of the team members have told me that they have PTSD from past jobs. Like it is really interesting being a boss, which is never something I ever thought I would be, like a business owner and a boss. Like 10 years ago, I could have never dreamed that. But people are like, oh my gosh, like my last workplace, you you know, like I have PTSD and I'm like, oh, that's terrible. Like, you know, how can, what can we do to prevent that <laughs> for all of our team members? So not perfect, but I'm working on, on trying to be like almost like a countercultural workplace, you know, something that's different and especially having like a team that's, you know, at least 50% BIPOC, like, I think that's critical to make a safe workplace for them like for your own health. So yeah, that's a big priority of mine. And that's one reason I do invest so much in my own education is because I feel like I have a heavy responsibility as the founder of this business and as like the boss of a lot of people who work for me that I, I could harm a lot of people if I'm not careful. And so I, I wish more white Americans, especially managers and people in positions of authority would have that same sense of like heavy responsibility. Like, oh geez, like my education was really messed up. I need to re-educate myself on these issues and like make conscious decisions to create a better workplace for my employees. And maybe let's go a little bit deeper into that because with black, the black tiles that you started doing with EBB, as well as um, a really outward support for Pride Month, can you speak about what it's been like for EBB to take a strong stance on social justice issues during kind of hot button times and, you know, getting backlash? How did you manage with comments coming in that were negative? And, you know, just how did that affect EBB's reputation in like good ways and also maybe challenging ways? You know, I never really was worried about our reputation. So I don't know if it took a hit or not. Um, I was more worried about like doing what's right, which to me makes it an easy decision to speak out about things like, for example, Pride Month when we posted uh, a picture of a trans birthing family and got so much lashback and that and the murder of George Floyd and just sensing the heartbreak and the, the trauma of, of the black birthing community. It's one of those things where sometimes as a white person, you're not exactly like sure what to do, but then you just realize, um, well, what would white culture do? White, white culture would be very polished and professional, and they'd put out a statement, um, a written statement, saying something just with words, but they wouldn't actually mean it, and they wouldn't put any, they wouldn't put any emotion into it, and it wouldn't be authentic. And that is probably what like 95% of white-owned businesses, if not more, were doing. And you're nodding, so I know you agree with me. So I get monthly counseling from Dr. Saida Pepra about my anti-racism journey again, because it's so important for me, like to be on this journey because of the number of people whose lives I impact. And she told me like white culture is, is polished and professional. Like you just need to just be yourself. And so I did. So both times we were kind of in these crisis modes, I just went on social media and shared a video, a live video of me talking about, you know, why we're taking a stand and what this means and why it's important, what I'm doing in my personal life and just trying to talk to people like heart to heart. And that was definitely the right decision. So I credit Dr. Saida Pepper with coaching me towards like, you know, avoiding white supremacy, even in my responses, if that makes sense. So um, I don't know how we were affected. I'm, I know we, I'm sure we lost a lot of followers, but I could have, I could care less. I don't know. How is that proper grammar? I could have cared less or I could care less either. What, you know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> that does go. You know, when they left, they left, they're not, they're not going to be part of our community and maybe they'll come back, but we're taking a stand and, and it's important because it's the right thing to do. And I often think about like a hundred years from now, what will people say about one issue or another? Their legacy is like gone. It's, it's been killed because of some terrible thing they said that they didn't know was racist or, you know, so I'm like trying to avoid that. I keep thinking of a hundred years from now, like what would people say about those issues? And to me, it's super clear that we need to be taking a strong stand on black human rights and on um, LGBTQ rights as well. 
And I bring this up and even this entire podcast, not just to say, oh, look at Rebecca as a perfect ally. And, you know, but I, but I, I, and this wasn't Rebecca's idea. This was actually my idea. I kept pushing the same. We really need to show what it looks like on the inside because there, are, after working with a lot of different white people over the last year, um, Minnesota Healing Justice Network, and seeing how there was kind of an, an ease for whatever reason in your background um, or the inner work that you do to say things like, you know, to me, working around the time of the Derek Chauvin trial, like if I need to take some time off, you know, go ahead and do that. Or if something's too triggering that comes up in social media comments, you know, we'll handle it for you. Or coming to our team, asking what what can we do to help one another um, in managing kind of the potential backlash around Pride Month posts. I want to make sure that people understand there's a lot of work that's going on behind the scenes and to just see what that looks like. And even things like the way you edit maybe some of the podcast um, comments that might be not in alignment with even the values, like you're really being intentional and making space um, within your organization and not that you're doing it perfectly, not that we're not all living in white supremacy culture all the time, myself included. But um, I, I love opening up this conversation of like, what are the things that we can do? Small, small things. Like this is not leaving your job and becoming an activist on the streets. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's, it seems small, but it's, it's big. Like, you know, just like you said, like getting to know when people's birthdays are <laughs> as, you know, and celebrating that, but, but also like, you know, the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder and then the trial of Derek Chauvin and like knowing that for you, like just being telling you that, you know, there's grace and to rest and we don't expect you to be here or to be here a hundred percent, whichever you choose. And I think it's when I'm in a relationship, like we talked about being in relationship and in solidarity with one another, when I'm in relationship with someone who is living a life as a black person in America, I have to always keep in mind that there's a lot of racial trauma and that you may need to rest at times and that I need to use my privilege to protect you from certain situations or topics. It's almost like there's this like soul wound that I have to be aware of at all times as like that this wound was created by white Americans and I have to be cognizant of that and to make sure that I'm not constantly reopening that wound, for example, or that I'm not allowing other people to cause harm and aggravate it if I have the influence to stop it. So it's hard for me to kind of really put words on it, but it almost feels like being in friendship or in relationship with like a wounded or traumatized veteran, you know, which I've never been in close relationship with, with someone like that. But from what I've read, it seems like research is showing that the trauma that comes from racialized violence in our country is similar to trauma that comes from warfare. And so I don't see people as weak. It, I see like people like you as incredibly strong, but I have to recognize that a wound is present and that people like me have played a role in that. So it's like, and I, I see you're tearing up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just like, it's just like, I think I have to be hyper aware of that. It's my responsibility. And I, I think most white people aren't hyper aware of their role and they haven't done the inner work to, to think about it because of the either or thinking. They think either you're racist or you're not. And I'm definitely not a bad person, so I'm not racist. And so they don't even start the inner work of realizing what they're doing that is causing harm. Lots of little things that we white women in particular do that cause harm all the time. So, yeah, when we talked a lot about at our retreat about protection and, you know, the difference between protection versus being a white savior. And I'm not perfect at distinguishing between that, but. So one of the things I've read a lot about is how black women and girls in particular in America are not considered worthy of protection by many white people. And that is something that needs to change. So I want to be part of that change. So, yes, I'm crying over here. When you say, yes, yeah, soul wound, that definitely resonates. Um, warfare, I've never heard of that, that comparison, but especially after coming out of the uprisings. And, you know, for many of us, Minnesota Healing Justice Network, it was 
blocks. It was we smelt the fire. It was we um, couldn't open our <clears throat> our doors, or we were, had barricaded uh, our doors and spent nights watching the unicorn riots um, and hearing of reports of the KKK, and it very truly, viscerally felt like war. And for myself, having previously worked in the United Nations and the Democratic Republic of Congo, where there was active war, for me, the PTSD came because I had been in war. And this, again, felt exactly like war. And I'll say on a cellular level, because I'm mixed race, I have white DNA, I have black DNA, and how the two sides felt truly. I mean, you see the line of the protesters and you see the line of the police, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it felt so much like war. And so I do, at least for myself and probably many others, it, it feels like a constant battle and a constant sense of not finding safety. And so to be able to find a few people in that, I would say you're in my soul family, <laughs> Rebecca, that you can, you know, start to find a place where you can find ease is really healing. I know it can be hard to get to a place where you can trust to find that. But um, I'm grateful to, to be on this journey of trying to find that place with you. And I think that the idea of protection, you know, it's not just protecting like a child who can't fend for themselves. Like we're right. obviously also can fend for ourselves plenty, but there are certain instances where, to be honest, all of us want to be protected by each other. You know, that's something we can all do for each other. And I feel like, for the white people in my life, why I started teaching so much more in cultural medicines is because I saw a lot of white people falling into the urgency, falling into the perfectionism, falling into, you know, being on time is more important than bringing your presence um, and feeling grounded. And so I really feel like my ancestors, my, my, especially my Nigerian side of the family has a really good ability to kind of stay happy through, stay happy and relaxed through even a global pandemic. And I feel like that's something that I offer to white people in my circles as well as like, there is a deeper part of your culture, go back to European before um, capitalism, before the witch trials, right? You, if you identify as a woman, there's this sense of cultural groundedness and like returning to your soul that I think a lot of people who have really bought into capitalism, you have to kind of lose some of that culture and that soul. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm hoping to bring back as like a mutual exchange. So that. Yeah. I, I've learned so much from you, Iho too. Yeah. I've learned so much. And, you know, one gift you've given me at the retreat, you know, aside from your, your amazing um, presentation and meditation you did with everybody was just, you know, teaching me that, you know, birth workers are healers and nurses are healers. And, you know, you've educated me a lot about the history of healers and different healing traditions. And that's something that, you know, white supremacy and colonization took away from, um, from, um, in particular females, um, was that we were not considered healers. We were turned into assistants and, you know, the doctor's handmaiden kind of thing and not actually like healers with the power of healing touch. And, and so that was really, you know, you've, you've educated me on a lot of subjects, but that's one that recently really touched me was like kind of claiming that identity is like, I'm a nurse, but I'm part of a deeper healing tradition that was kind of taken away that title and I'm going to reclaim it. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Yes, as birth workers, you know, and I want to say too, whether or not, however you identify gender wise, I mean, di like digging into that place where you're a nurturer, you're a lover, that's in all of us. And from that soul place doing our work, I think like going to that sub conscious level below the money we're trying to make and the business we're trying to run and the reputation, right? Like dropping beneath that work and reputation and status part of ourselves. That's where we find the ability to connect across all kinds of backgrounds, no matter how we were raised, if we're familiar with people or not, how to do the work to be safe for each other. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's endless amounts of oppression and I don't want to get into the oppression Olympics where we're comparing different kinds of oppression, but I'm, you know, as someone 
who is focused on solidarity, I have to keep working on heterosexism um, and classism and ableism and other forts of, uh, forms of isms. And I'm reading this book. It's called uh, Readings for Diversity and Social Justice. It's a textbook that was edited by Morian Adams, Warren Blumenfeld, Carmelita Rosie Castaneda, Heather Hackman, Madeline Peters, and Zimena Zuniga. And Dan, my husband, and I have been reading this. It is, you know, um, I don't know, like 700 pages long, but it is the most incredible. Yeah, it, it's the most incredible book I've ever read. And I feel like it's teaching me everything that like I was not taught in school and graduate school. And I'm getting like this huge education from these authors who've compiled this like work of art just about all of the different kinds of oppression. And I'm halfway through it. And so I know like, you know, I'm not perfect. If I've said anything on this podcast today that offends someone, I apologize. I'm trying <laughs> and I'm going to keep trying and people correct me still. And when they correct me, I just, I thank them and I take it really seriously and I think on it for a long time. And then hopefully I move on like a better person. And I want to say that publicly too, even as a person of color, but also someone who's light skinned, who has um, European ancestry that, you know, who, who grew up as, in a very um, cisgendered world, especially the birth world, you know, there's a lot of gender gendering and um, assumption that everybody's a cis woman. And so I'm grateful to be inspired, even as a person of color, like no, no one is exempt from this work and exempt from the, the having the power to, to harm or to be a safe person or to be a protector for others. So I, I'm grateful for the, the inspiration that I see your straight talking this <laughs> doing in the world with a big platform that you have as well. Yeah, I'm grateful to, to be in community with the beautiful team that you've cultivated that is extremely diverse as well, and um, that we can have straight talk amongst ourselves as a team and learn from each other. So with that, I'll say, was there any other final thoughts or words or ideas you wanted to bring up? No, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you pulled a lot out of me, but I appreciate <laughs> you doing this interview and last week's interview as well, Iho, too. Absolutely. So grateful for you, too. Thank you, everyone, for celebrating with us on our 200th episode. And we hope we'll have many more to come. Many more to come. Bye, everyone. Bye. This podcast episode was brought to you by the Evidence-Based Birth Childbirth Class. This is Rebecca speaking. When I walked into the hospital to have my first baby, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Since then, I've met countless parents who felt that they too were unprepared for the birth process and navigating the healthcare system. The next time I had a baby, I learned that in order to have the most empowering birth possible, I needed to learn the evidence on childbirth practices. We are now offering the evidence-based birth childbirth class totally online. In your class, you will work with an instructor who will skillfully mentor you and your partner in evidence-based care, comfort measures, and advocacy. So that you can both embrace your birth and parenting experiences with courage and confidence. Get empowered with an interactive online childbirth class you and your partner will love. Visit evidencebasedbirth.com slash childbirth class to find your class now.